Saul Bellow was born in Canada in 1915 and grew up in Chicago. He attended Chicago, Northwestern, and Wisconsin universities and has a Bachelor of Science in Anthropology. He has been a visiting lecturer at Princeton and New York universities and associate professor at the University of Minnesota and has also lived in Paris and traveled extensively in Europe. He was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1948 and has received a grant from the Ford Foundation. He is a member of the National Institute of Arts and Letters. In addition to stories and reviews contributed to many, many leading American magazines and quarterlies, Saul Bellow has published six novels, of which Dangling Man was the first, 1944. This was followed by The Victim, The Adventures of Augie March, which, like Herzog, won the National Book Award, Seize the Day, 1957, and Henderson the Rain King, 1959. Herzog is the latest. All are available in Penguins. He has also written several plays of which A Win and Orange Souffle have been published in Penguins. Another play, The Last Analysis, was performed in New York in 1965. Saul Bellow is married and has three sons, now lives in Chicago, where he is a member of the Committee on Social Thought. He's got to be dead by now. Got to be. This book was... A 1966 edition, but the book itself is uh, Seize the Day, 1951, and here's how it starts. Chapter 1. When it came to concealing his troubles, Tommy Wilhelm was not less capable than the next fellow. So at least he thought, and there was a certain amount of evidence to back him up. He had once been an actor. No, not quite. Uh, an extra. But he knew what acting should be. Also, he was smoking a cigar. And when a man is smoking a cigar, wearing a hat, he has an advantage. It's harder to find out how he feels. He came from the 23rd floor down to the lobby on the mezzanine to collect his mail before breakfast, and he believed, he hoped, that he looked passably well, doing all right. It was a matter of sheer hope, because there was not much that he could add to his present effort. On the 14th floor, he looked for his father to enter the elevator. They often met at this hour on the way to breakfast. If he worried about his appearance, it was mainly for his old father's sake. But there was no stop on the 14th, and the elevator sank and sank. Then the smooth door opened, and the great dark red uneven carpet that covered the lobby billowed toward Wilhelm's feet. In the foreground, the lobby was dark, sleepy. French drapes like sails kept out the sun but three high, narrow windows were open, and in the blue air, Wilhelm saw a pigeon about to light on the great chain that supported the marquee of the movie house directly underneath the lobby. For one moment, he heard the wings beat strongly. Most of the guests at the Hotel Gloriana were past the age of retirement. Along Broadway in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, a great part of New York's vast population of old men and women lives. Unless the weather is too cold or wet, they fill the benches about the tiny railed parks and along the subway gratings from Verity Square to Columbia University. 
They crowd the shops and cafeterias, and dime stores, the tea rooms, the bakeries, the beauty parlors, the reading rooms, and club rooms. Among these old people at the Gloriana, Wilhelm felt out of place. He was comparatively young, in his middle forties, large and blonde, with big shoulders. His back was heavy and strong, if already a little stooped or thickened. After breakfast, the old guests sat down on the green leather armchairs and sofas in the lobby and began to gossip and look into the papers. They had nothing to do but wait out the day. But Wilhelm was used to an active life and liked to go out energetically in the morning. And for several months, because he had no position, he'd kept up his morale by rising early. He was shaved and in the lobby by eight o'clock. He bought the paper and some cigars and drank a Coke or two before he went in to breakfast with his father. After breakfast, out, out, out to attend business. The getting out had in itself become the chief business, but he had realized that he could not keep this up much longer, and today he was afraid. He was aware that his routine was about to break up, and he sensed that a huge trouble long presaged, but till now formless, was due. Before evening, he knew. Or he would know what it, what it was. Nevertheless, he followed his daily course and crossed the lobby. Reuben, the man at the newsstand, had poor eyes. They may not have been actually weak, but they were poor in expression, with lacy lids that furled down at the corners. He dressed well. It didn't seem necessary. He was behind the counter most of the time, but he dressed very well. He had on a rich brown suit. The cuffs embarrassed the hairs on his small hands. He wore a Countess Mara painted necktie. As Wilhelm approached, Reuben did not see him. He was looking out dreamily at the Hotel Ansonia, which was visible from his corner several blocks away. The Ansonia the neighborhood's great landmark was built by Stanford White. It looks like Baroque Palace from Prague or Munich, enlarged a hundred times, with towers, domes, huge swells and bubbles of metal gone, gone green from exposure, iron fretwork and festoons. Black television antenna are densely planted on its round summits. Under the changes of weather, it may look like marble or like seawater, black as slate in the fog, white as tufa in the sunlight. This morning, it looked like the image of itself reflected in deep water, white and cumulus of above with cavernous distortions underneath. Together, the two men gazed at it. Then Reuben said, Your dad is into breakfast already, the old gentleman. Oh, yes, ahead of me today. That's a real knockout shirt you got on, said Reuben. Where is it from, Sex? No, it's from Jack Fagman, Chicago. Even when his spirits were low, Wilhelm could still wrinkle his forehead in a pleasing way. Some of the slow, silent movements of his face were very attractive. He went back a step, as if to stand away from himself and get a better look at his shirt. His glance was comic, a comment upon his untidiness. He liked to wear good clothes, but once he had put it on each but once he had put it on each article appeared to go its own way. Wilhelm, laughing, panted a little. His teeth were small, his cheeks, when he laughed and puffed, grew round, and he looked much younger than his years. In the old days, when he was a college freshman and wore a raccoon coat and beanie on his large blonde head, his father used to say that, big as he was, he could charm a bird out of a tree. Wilhelm had great charm still. I like the dove gray color, he said in his sociable, 
the sociable, good-natured way, it's not washable. You have to send it to the cleaner. It never smells as good as washed, but it's a nice shirt. It costs 16, 18 bucks. This shirt had not been bought by Wilhelm. It was a present from his boss, his former boss, with whom he had had a falling out. But there was no reason why he should tell Reuben the history of it. Although perhaps Reuben knew. Reuben was the kind of man who he would know. Wilhelm also knew many things about Reuben, for that matter, about Reuben's wife and Reuben's business, Reuben's health. None of these could be mentioned, and the great weight of the unspoken left them a little to talk about. Well, you're looking pretty sharp today, Reuben said. And Wilhelm said gladly, Am I? Do you really think so? He could not believe it. He saw his reflection in the glass cupboard full of cigar boxes, among the grand seals and paper damask, and the gold embossed portraits of famous men, Garcia, Edward the Seventh, Cyrus the Great. You had to allow for the darkness and deformations of the glass. <clears throat> but he thought he didn't look too good. A wide wrinkle like a comprehensive bracket sign was written upon his forehead. The point between his brows and there were patches of brown on his dark blonde skin. He began to be half amused at the shadow of his marveling, troubled, desirous eyes. And his nostrils and his lips. Amused at it all. Fair-haired hippopotamus. That was how he looked to himself. He saw a big round face, a wide flourishing red mouth, stumped teeth, and the hat too. And the cigar too. I should have done hard labor all my life, he reflected. Hard on its labor that tires you out and makes you sleep. I'd have worked off my energy and felt better. Instead, I had to distinguish myself. Yet. He'd put forth plenty of effort, but that was not the same as working hard, was it? And if as a young man he had got off to a bad start, then it was due to this very same face. Early in the 1930s, because of his striking looks. He had been very briefly considered star material, and he had gone to Hollywood. There for seven years, stubbornly, he had tried to become a screen artist. Long before that time, his ambition or delusion had ended, but uh, through pride and perhaps also through laziness, he had remained there in California. At last he turned to other things, but those seven years of persistence and defeat had unfitted him somehow for trades and businesses. And then it was too late to go into one of the professions. He had been slow to mature, and he had lost ground. So he hadn't been able to get rid of his energy, and he was convinced that this energy itself had done him the greatest harm. I didn't see you at the gin game last night, said Reuben. I had to miss it. How did it go? For the last few weeks, Wilhelm had played gin almost nightly, but yesterday he had felt that he couldn't afford to lose any more. He'd never won. Not once. And while the losses were small, they weren't gains, were they? They were losses. He was tired of losing, and tired also of the company, and so he had gone by himself to the movies. Oh, said Reuben, it went okay. Carl made a chump of himself yelling at the guys. This time Dr. Tampkin didn't let him get away with it. He told him the psychological reason why. What was the reason? Reuben said, I can't quote him. Who could? You know the way Tampkin talks. Don't ask me. Do you want the trib? Aren't you going to look at the closing quotations? It won't help much to look. I know what they were yesterday at three, said Wilhelm. But I suppose I'd better get the paper. It seemed necessary for him to lift one shoulder in order to put his hand into his jacket pocket. There, among little packets of pills and crushed cigarette butts and strings of cellophane, the red tapes of packages, which he sometimes used as dental floss, he recalled that he had dropped some pennies. 
That doesn't sound so good, said Reuben. He meant to be conversationally playful, but his voice had no tone, and his eyes, slack and lid-blinded, turned elsewhere. He didn't want to hear. It was all the same to him. Maybe he already knew, being the sort of man who knew and knew. No, it wasn't good. Wilhelm had three orders of lard in the commodities market. He and Dr. Tampkin had brought had bought this lard together four days ago at twelve ninety six, and the price at once began to fall and was still falling. In the mail this morning there was sure to be a call for additional margin payment. One came every day. The psychologist, Dr. Tamkin, had got him into this. Tamkin lived at the Gloriana and attended the card game. He had explained to Wilhelm that you could speculate in commodities at one of the uptown branches of a good Wall Street house without making the full deposit of margin, uh, the full deposit legally required. It was up to the branch manager, if he knew you, and all the branch managers knew Tamkin, he would allow you to make short-term purchases. You needed only to open a small account. The whole secret of this type of speculation, Tamkin had told him, is in the alertness. You have to act fast. Buy it and sell it. Sell it and buy it again. Quick. Get to the window and have them wire Chicago at just the right second. Strike and strike again. Then get out of this. Get get out on the same day. In no time at all, you'll have. You will turn over fifteen, twenty. 20000 15 or $20,000. Whatever it is. Soybeans, coffee, corn, hides, wheat, cotton. Obviously, the doctor understood the market well. Otherwise, he could not make it sound so simple. People lose because they're greedy and can't get out when it starts to go up. They gamble, but I do it scientifically. This is not guesswork. You must take a few points and get out. Why, ye gods, said Dr. Tamkin with his bulging eyes, his bald head, and his drooping lip. Why have you stopped to think how much dough people are making in the market? No wonder Wilhelm delayed the moment when he would have had to go into the dining room. He had moved to the end of Reuben's counter. He had opened the tribune. The fresh pages drooped from his hands. The cigar was smoked out and the hat did not defend him. He was wrong to suppose that he was more capable than the next fellow when it came to concealing his troubles. They were clearly written out upon his face. He wasn't even aware of it. There was the matter of the different names which in the hotel came up frequently. Are you Dr. Adler's son? Yes, but my name is Tommy Wilhelm. And the doctor would say, My son and I use different monikers. I uphold tradition. He's for the new. The Tommy was Wilhelm's own invention. He adopted it when he went to Hollywood and dropped the Adler. <clears throat> Hollywood was his own idea, too. He used to pretend that it had all been the uh, doing of a certain talent scout named Maurice Venice. But the scout had never made him a definite offer of a studio connection. He had approached him, but the results of the screen tests had not been good. After the test, Wilhelm took the initiative and pressed Maurice Venice until he got him to say, Well, I suppose you might make it out there. On the strength of this, Wilhelm had left college and had gone to California. Someone had said, and Wilhelm agreed with the saying, that in Los Angeles, all the loose objects in the country were collected as if America had been t tilted and everything that wasn't tightly screwed down had slid into Southern California. He himself had been one of these objects. Sometimes he told people, I was too mature for college. I was a big boy, you see. Well, I thought when you, when do you start to become a man? After he had driven a painted flivver and had worn a yellow sticker with slogans on it and played illegal poker and gone out on Coke dates, he had had college. He wanted to try something new and quarreled with his parents about his career 
and then a letter came from Maurice Venice. The story of the scout was long and intricate, and there were several versions of it. The truth about it was never told. Wilhelm had lied first boastfully and then out of clerk, out of charity to himself. But his memory was good, and he could still separate what he had invented from the actual happenings. And this morning he found it necessary as he stood by Reuben's showcase with his tribune to recall the crazy course of the true events. I didn't seem even to realize that there was a depression. How could I have been such a jerk as not to prepare for anything and just go on luck and inspiration? With round, gray eyes expanded and his large, shapely lips closed in severity toward himself, he forced open all that had been hidden. Dad, I couldn't affect one way or the other. Mama was the one who tried to stop me, and we carried on and yelled and pleaded. The more I lied, the louder I raised my voice and charged like a hippopotamus. Poor mother, how I disappointed her. Reuben heard Wilhelm give a broken sigh as he stood with the forgotten tribune crushed under his arm. When Wilhelm was aware that Reuben watched him, loitering and idle, apparently not knowing what to do with himself this morning, he turned to the Coca-Cola machine. He swallowed hard at the Coke bottle and coughed over it. But he ignored his coughing, for he was still thinking, his eyes upcast and his lips closed behind his hand. By a peculiar twist of habit, he wore his coat collar turned up always, as though there were a wind. It never lay flat, but on his broad back, stooped with its own weight, its strength warped almost into deformity. The collar of his sports coat appeared anyway to be no wider than a, than a ribbon. He was listening to the sound of his own voice as he explained, 25 years ago in the living room on West End Avenue. But mother, if I don't pan out as an actor, I can still go back to school. But she was afraid he was going to destroy himself. She said, Wilkie, dad could make it easy for you if he wanted to go into medicine. To remember this stifled him. I can't bear hospitals. Besides, I might make a mistake and hurt someone or even kill a patient. I couldn't stand that. Besides, I haven't got that sort of brains. Then his mother had made the mistake of mentioning her nephew, Ari, Wilhelm's cousin, who was an honor student at Columbia in maths and languages. That dark little gloomy Ari with his disgusting narrow face and his moles and self-sniffing ways and his unclean table manners, the boring habit he had of conjugating verbs when you went for a walk with him. Remaining is an easy language. You just add a TL to everything. He was now a professor, this same Artie with whom Wilhelm had played near the Soldiers and Sailors Monument on Riverside Drive. Not that to be a professor it was in itself so great. How could anyone bear to know so many languages? And Artie also had to remain Artie, which was a bad deal. But perhaps success had changed him. Now that he had a place in the world, perhaps he was better. Did Artie love his languages and live for them? Or was he also, in his heart, cynical? So many people nowadays were. No one seemed satisfied, and Wilhelm was especially horrified by the cynicism of successful people. Cynicism was bread and meat to everyone, and irony too. Maybe it couldn't be helped. It was probably even necessary. Wilhelm, however, feared it intensely. Whenever at the end of the day he was unusually fatigued, he attributed it to cynicism. Too much of the world's business done. Too much falsity. He had various words to express the effect that this had on him. Chicken, unclean, congestion, he exclaimed in his heart. Rat race, phony, murder, play the game, buggers, 